great. There we go. Yeah. So we are recording and we will send out a copy of the, of the video to everyone if you want to share it with any of your colleagues, um, either within your agency or outside of your agency as well. Great. Thanks, Chris. So jump back to share. Yep. Um, and good that everybody knows that this is, this is being recorded and that you'll get an opportunity to have that. Um, if you have to step away from your device, uh, what we ask is, is that you, put, you pause your video feed so that either your name or if you put a picture in there comes up and then folks don't get dizzy as, as you're, you're moving around. Uh, use, if you would, use the chat feature to post questions or share information. Um, the, all that goes into the chat will also be shared after that. So that's a really good way as things are going along. If something occurs to you, go ahead and enter it into chat. Um, please keep in mind that this webinar is only one opportunity for success service opportunities and, and needs at the Richter Center. This is a great connect um, and it's just one opportunity. They're, they are staying open, they're staying in touch. So that's our logistics and our etiquette for the context of the webinar. Today, uh, you'll get an update of what's going on at the state. We do have a, a panel of, you know, really, really solid CBOs to talk about virtual service examples. Uh, we'll talk about best practices for virtual service, which is really helpful right now. Brainstorming virtual service opportunities in your agency and then some upcoming opportunities and next steps. So that's an overview of what's going to happen here in the webinar. Um, and uh, if, yep, I'm sorry, Jackie, what was that? No, that wasn't me. I think maybe it's time to mute everybody. Yeah. Um, if you will all please, uh, again, make sure you go in. I don't believe that in this, set up right now with screen share that I can mute everyone. So okay. um, if you'll go ahead and mute yourself, I would appreciate it. Um, and then give you opportunities to go from there. So let me go back to screen share and we're going to talk a little bit about the Richter Center and what we do. Um, so at the Richter Center uh, at Fresno State, our role is to help support our students, our staff and our faculty in um, engaging with the community and on the other side of that equation to work with you our community partners to make sure that um, that you are able to connect with the resources here at Fresno State which are very diverse and um, pretty amazing some of you have already heard these numbers before but um, for the last since 2009 every single year our students have provided over 1 million hours of service um, last year, even within the, with the shutdowns in March and everything else, our students still provided 1.2 million hours of service last year alone. Um, that's equivalent to over 500 people working full time for 50 weeks out of the year. So, you know, quite a bit of, of hours, but more importantly, what stands behind those hours is the, the amount of service that is received by individuals in our community and by agencies like yours. And that service is everything from one hour donating blood. I know the Central California Blood Center is on the line today. Um, I will be down there today sticking out my arm. I've got an appointment at four o'clock. Um, everything from the one hour blood donation to short term, either a few hours or a full day or even a weekend kind of service event. Um, all the way through service learning classes where students are doing hours as part of a course requirement. Um, those students are typically doing a minimum amount of 15 hours, a minimum of 15 hours of service, upwards of 100 or more. And then we have service internships that many of you have utilized. Those students are doing, typically doing 150 hours or more. So we've got a lot of variation in the kinds of things that our students do with agencies in terms of the number of hours, the type of service. They, we work with over 200 agencies, uh, approximately, um, I just looked at the number today, uh, approximately 80 service learning classes that are gonna be offered in the fall. 
So a real, um, a, a real diverse continuum of service opportunities and that we work with the students, the staff, the faculty, and the agencies involved. Um, why we do what we do? Well, there's a whole lot of research behind the value of community engagement and service for college students. Certainly, you know the value of engaging volunteers in your um, organization, especially motivated, um, educated volunteers who um, have a significant time commitment um, as opposed to just coming in one time and then you never see them again. But this quote kind of gives you an idea about one of the, the, the philosophical reasons, I guess, if you were, that, um, if you would, that we do what we do. And it's when schools were invented, kids were experience rich and information poor. The world has changed, schools have not. Today, students and all of us can find almost any bit of information on our computers, on our, on our um, phones, on our, uh, on our devices, whatever they may be. And we can look up anything. Um, we don't need a, a, a teacher standing in front of the room or a textbook to learn that information necessarily. That's not to say that schools don't have a very important role. Certainly um, I, we, we are based in one and we know that that education, that formal education has um, benefits that you can't find on a device. That said, a hundred years ago, students had a lot more experience out in the real world, okay, than they do today. And so what we look to do is find ways to take what they're learning in the classroom and give them opportunities to utilize that information in the community. And without you, without our community partners, we would not have that ability to do that. Um, so we really want to combine the great education in the classroom they're receiving along with that experience that is so vital to them. So that's th those are the reasons that we do what we do. That gives you a little bit of background on what we do. And now let me bring you up to date on where we're at in terms of this, um, this upcoming fall semester and what things are looking like for us. Um, if you've heard different things out there in the news about you know, Fresno State and, and what it's gonna look like this next year, um, unfortunately, I can't tell you anything about what's happening with athletics. Uh, I have no insight information there at all, but what I can tell you is this. There will be students on campus next year, uh, next this coming fall, but it's a very small number. Approximately 2,200 students out of roughly 25,000 who would normally be on campus taking classes. So a very small percentage uh, of students, um, a very small percentage of instructors, and a very small percentage of classes overall. And one of the things that that means is that many of our students will not be living on or near campus or even in Fresno as they would otherwise be um, if it was a regular semester. So our students come from a five county service area. Um, and for example, students who live in Porterville um, or who live in Modesto or who live in Aubury don't need to come and get a, an apartment in Fresno if all of their classes are online. So that does mean that many of our students who might be living in Fresno and able um, to serve in person will not be available to serve in person. Then we also have the issues that the same issues that you're dealing with and that's around you know COVID-19 and the limitations of the CDC and the state and the local uh, health department um, in terms of operations and social distancing and all of those things. So um, there is an emphasis, a, a very big emphasis on providing virtual service opportunities for our students. And we know that that, um, that provides or, or create some challenges for you, but it does not mean that in-person service is off the table. As a matter of fact, the CSU policy and Fresno State's policy for all types of experiential learning, including internships and service learning, do allow for in-person service, okay? Now those in-person service placements must meet all of the relevant CDC, state, local health department guidelines which again, in order to operate, you have to follow at the same time. 
Um, and there may be some new risk management forms that we're just finalizing right now. As a matter of fact, some of you may be receiving that information asking for some updates to um, some self-evaluations and some other things in the coming weeks. But bottom line, we know that virtual is going to be a priority, in-person is possible, and we want to provide services to you however you need them. And so we'll be talking about that today. We'll be giving you some examples. We'll be talking about um, some ways that you can get information out about virtual and in-person service to our students. And we'll be giving you a chance to brainstorm with your colleagues um, in smaller groups about possible virtual service opportunities. Okay. Um, Jackie, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. We're so fortunate today to have three really really good uh, uh, organizations represented with good representatives to talk about successful examples of virtual service. Um, we've got, as I said, three, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you their names and then have them, we'll just bring them forward. I'll ask each of you to talk a little bit about yourself and your agency to share your experiences. Uh, Sarah Peddleti with Habitat for Humanity, uh, followed by Artie Padilla with Every Neighborhood Partnership, and then Lowell Ends with ENP. So Sarah, will you lead off for us? Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Sarah and I'm with Habitat Greater Fresno area. Uh, most people know Habitat for Building Houses, which we do. Um, with that, most of our volunteer opportunities people think of are very hands-on, uh, swinging a hammer to build a house, uh, completing uh, beautification projects at, at um, homes that are already existing. And so uh, virtual volunteering was a challenge for us, but um, we, we, made, we made the transition pretty quickly. Um, and so in March when we initially went into shelter in place, uh, we, we had our staff transition um, into working virtually aside from um, our staff that was at New Home Construction, our staff that was completing critical repairs, as well as our staff that was um, completing emergency essential delivery program. Um, but with that, we found that our, we were not having volunteers active at those sites. Uh, and so we, so we started virtual volunteer opportunities with Fresno State students in spring semester. Um, and so one of, a couple examples of, of things that worked really, really well for us specifically with Fresno State students. Um, the first was with the nursing program. We had a new partnership with the nursing program and we had partnered um, with our neighborhood revitalization. And they were initially going to be going out into the neighborhoods with us as we completed projects at owner occupied homes to really learn about community health. Um, needless to say, we stopped that program um, and, and put a pause on it so they were not able to go out. Um, and, and so we had students that were already placed with us and then there was a lot of other nursing students whose sites had completely shut down. And so we, we went into a different mode on how we could engage those students in meaningful projects virtually. Uh, and we, we actually had some really, really good outcomes. Some of them were direct, were related to marketing or to uh, nursing. Some of them were related more to marketing. Um, and so some of those projects where they went through all of our photos, which we have millions of photos uh, and actually change the names on them so they were easy to search. Uh, one thing we had challenges with was finding a photo. If we wanted a photo of a volunteer with a hammer, we had to go through tons of pictures to find a volunteer with a hammer. Uh, and so we actually had them rename uh, a lot of the photos so that we have a really solid uh, database of our photos to use. Uh, we also had them complete research projects and this was the one that was not necessarily planned. Um, but it ended up working out amazingly and had a pretty significant impact on our organization, especially as we were trying to navigate what, what this, this new environment for our nonprofit looked like. Uh, and we actually had the student complete a research project and research uh, how to engage with, with the community through social media, uh, specifically with fundraising, as well as development plans if we were going to be going into a recession. Um, or in, in circumstances where really the economic status of our donors was unknown. And so she ended up doing a research project. She had 20 hours left. Uh, and at the end, she sent us four comprehensive PowerPoints that put together all of her findings. Um, and it went beyond our individual donor engage, 
our donor engagement um, specialist who focuses on individual donors and our actual and our development team and our executive director actually utilize that project as a as a created their their plan going forward throughout the summer and into the next fiscal year. So that was a really significant project. Uh, we also use the opportunity to really look at some areas that we we weren't able to do on a regular basis. And so there were some things we had our wish list of items, but we never had the capacity to do it. So things like calls. Um, we made a, over 200 calls to individual volunteers just to check in and see how they were and see if there was anything we could do to help. Um, in addition, we also started a new project. Um, this is a great example of how we were able to transition from that hands-on building to a virtual opportunity that directly impacts the building. And so we have a program that builds ramps for our seniors. Um, essentially, it's where steps are, they're no longer able to safely use steps, so they install a ramp or half steps, which are steps that are half the size. Uh, and so we, we typically would have volunteers come out and help build those. Um, without volunteers, we had a single staff member doing it. And so we were able to engage construction management student who had specific interest in drafting and architectural design uh, to help draft plans for those half steps so that the one staff member was able to more efficiently make them since it was a single person making them rather than having a whole team make them. And so those are, those are a few of the examples. We also did a lot in terms of engagement. We are continually transitioning our engagement um, on site to something that we can do via direct mail or, or um, email or phone calls. But those are some examples of projects specifically done with Fresno State students that have gone really, really well for us um, transitioning from that hands on face-to-face -face service to a virtual environment. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Great creativity. Next, we'll hear from Artie Padilla, who is with Every Neighborhood Partnership. Artie? You know, Are Jackie, you as I'm looking down the list, I, I'd seen Artie before. Oh, there he is. Is he there? Yeah, he's not on. Artie, Artie with us? Hi, Artie. Hello, friends. Welcome. Good to be here. Sorry. You're up. Uh, okay. Yeah, you're up, Artie. Are you <laughs> here with this? What am I doing right now? Introduction? I think you you introduce yourself and then share with us some of those uh, good virtual service experiences that you've had with your folks, with the, with Fresno State folks. Okay. So, yeah, Artie Padilla, Every Neighborhood Partnership. I think my colleague Erica is on as well. Um, we are, um, traditionally we have a ton of in-person opportunities. We've shifted obviously with COVID since we are very closely tied to our schools. Those are closed. Um, we are, we do have some in-person opportunities still, and I know that's not the focus of this Zoom, but we have a lot of food distributions and it looks like we're going to be moving forward with some very small group tutoring programs at churches and community centers, apartment complexes. But virtually, um, Erica, Janessa, our literacy team, um, they're gonna be looking at different virtual um, tutoring platforms. Um, they actually have a, a, a conversation next week with Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. Um, but we're also having a similar conversation with um, another group that is looking at some social emotional virtual platforms to do some uh, uh, services for both kids and parents. Um, there's another, plat uh, another group that's talking about virtual parent support um, uh, opportunities. So these are, these are opportunities for students to come alongside some, uh, some community professionals um, and do some learning in these future um, uh, virtual opportunities down the road. So we're, EMP is gonna have a mix of both virtual and in-person opportunities um, within the next month. All right, thanks so much, Artie, appreciate it. We also have Lowell Enns, who's with... Um... <laughs> e -E I'm sorry, I did. I was, I was suddenly I got, had come up with the letters. Hi, Lowell, with EPU. Could you share with your experiences with us? That was good, Jackie. Thank you. I know, blank. 
Oh, and before you said we were with, I was with ENP, and I just was honored by that because I've always wanted to work for Artie. So, did I, did I say that? honestly, I, I do trans, you know, pose. So, thank you for your gracious. <laughs> that was great. I like it. Uh, <laughs> So yes, I am the CEO of Exceptional Parents Unlimited. Uh, we are a 44-year-old organization here in Fresno. Most people think of us as that organization that works with young children with disabilities. Um, we actually have that program, but we also have uh, quite a few other programs that we operate uh, actually across 13 counties. We have offices in Merced, Hanford, and down in San Bernardino, actually. Uh, and then we cover uh, services for families with children with disabilities ages zero to 26 across 13 counties all the way from the eastern border of California to the western border of California. So that's an important role that we play. Uh, we also uh, are some of the founding members of uh, early childhood and infant mental health here in Fresno. Uh, we've been operating that program for about 14 years uh, at Exceptional Parents Unlimited. And then we also have uh, several large contracts with Department of Social Services here in Fresno. Uh, we offer uh, quite a few um, programs that work with families that have experienced trauma, children and families, mostly young children. Uh, again, that's normally our focus. Uh, we have about 130 employees. Uh, we do not use a lot of just um, short-term volunteers, but we do work very, very closely with Fresno State uh, with longer term intern internships. And many of those were disrupted significantly uh, back in March uh, when many of our organizations, including us, uh, shut down uh, to the public. So for example, we had a physical therapist intern that was finishing out their hours and uh, we were able to uh, convert to virtual and work with the teacher and, um, and our staff to ensure that that person got the hours that they needed. But Definitely for us, it's been a huge impact uh, as we've gone to working from home, working virtually with our families. Many of our families have children uh, that are medically fragile, and so we have been very, very hesitant to start working in person in any way uh, with families. Uh, but we are a very relational organization. Almost all of our programs are built on working one-on-one -on -one directly with families. And so it's been very, very difficult for my staff. I think it's been difficult for our interns to make that, make that transition. Um, one, of the, one of the programs that we have been working on uh, together with the speech pathology department at Fresno State and the talk team, a local speech uh, provider here in Fresno and our infant family program uh, was something called speech camps. We had applied for a grant and had gotten that. It's actually in its second year. Uh, we're providing that service um, to, uh, to children under the age of three in that program. And that has actually just recently switched over to virtual and it's actually gone okay. So we're looking at that and some other models for this fall, how, how we can uh, provide service opportunities for students, um, but also excited about the opportunity maybe to have some in-person as we are able to navigate the, the risk management of personal protective gear and all that stuff, uh, going into homes, working with families, we definitely want to get back to that relational side. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lowell. So, so thank you to all three of you because what we have is a sort of range of experiences with different kinds of services that you have and some of the different possibilities. Love hearing about the innovation and creativity. So uh, Chris, next, uh, next step here in our process. Yeah. So I think, um, Trish, are you okay to do the best practices? And we'll have Lowell and, uh, and Artie and Sarah chime in. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, I had to find my um, unmute button on the side <laughs> when your screen's turned towards me. Yeah, sorry that. about that. Sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I think we're all trying to figure out how to make all this work. Um, and so Chris just put together some best practices as best we could for um, virtual volunteering, which for those of you who have been doing it, I'm sure, um, I, you know, if you want to put in the chat what you've been doing to help with this, um, that would be helpful for other people that maybe haven't had a chance to um, work virtually with students or volunteers yet. Um, so we think it's important to continue to do the orientation and training even if it's virtual. The students need to know or the volunteers need to know um, what your agency's mission is, what your um, what you guys do, what your services that you provide. Um, and then 
try to give them, you know, deadlines, hold them accountable, check in with them. Um, I feel like a lot of people, if you're home, and I feel like we've all been through this, it's, it's nice to get out and see people, even if it's on a telephone call or on a Zoom or something like that. So I'm um, trying to help those volunteers feel um, like they're important and that you're still there for them, even though they're not in, in person. Um, and then recognize them, acknowledge them um, throughout the process of them doing their virtual volunteer service. Um, and then when it's completed, recognizing them. Um, and I think at some point we all hope that we're gonna go back to um, semi-normal or at least maybe we get to see each other a little bit more. Um, and so that's important for students because this is your chance to connect with students even if it's not in person, but it's a chance to connect with them and maybe um, at some point they will be in your office or at your agency doing um, work for you. Um, in person, which all the, once all the virtual is uh, hopefully not, that's all we're doing. So, um, and if anybody, like I said, if anybody has any other ideas or things that have worked for you, please go ahead and put those in the chat so we can make sure that we have those as well. Yeah, it could be ideas that you have for um, ways to uh, provide orientations virtually. Uh, it might be, um, you know, the kinds of practices you use to check in with volunteers, to acknowledge them. Uh, I shared a little story yesterday, a uh, former faculty member here at Fresno State, Sally Tannenbaum, uh, used to uh, do, teach a lot of service learning classes. Sally's youngest son uh, was in high school at the time, and she got him involved in service over the summer to get him some experience. And he volunteered at a couple of places. And she um, relayed to me a story about she had picked him up one day after one of the volunteer places and she and he said yeah mom I really like that place more than the other place and she was like well why what is it about you know what you're doing there and she says you know they know my name and they give me pizza <laughs> and, and I think that what that is is it's a way of acknowledging that, that that person is important by them just knowing that that you know that boy's name but also the way of acknowledging them that you know you're important to us and so we're going to feed you uh, now, I know in a virtual setting, you're not going to be feeding anybody necessarily, but just acknowledging them is, a, is, a, is an important thing to do. So you can add that in any ideas and practices that you have. Go ahead and put those into chat. Um, we'll, we'll do our best to review those. Um, but at this point in time, we are going to go to uh, small group breakout sessions with approximately four to five people in each breakout. And if you've never done a breakout on Zoom, um, you'll be automatically assigned to a group and it will take up, um, um, you know, 30 seconds to a minute or so to move everybody around into these groups. And when you're in those groups, you're going to have a chance with four or five others to brainstorm ideas with your colleagues about ways to engage volunteers virtually. Um, and the you'll receive a couple of updates from me and then automatically you'll get a one minute um, uh, warning that the breakouts will be ending. Um, we ask that please have somebody jot down some notes and be ready to toss into chat some ideas about the ways that you came up with that you might be able to engage students virtually. Um, what we will do is not only will we save this recording and share it with all of you, we will also save the chat from today's workshop and we will share that with you. So you will be able to refer back to those ideas and, and be able to stimulate some conversations within your own organization or for yourself from everybody that's been involved in today's workshop. And that's uh, again about 40, 45 people. Um, are involved today. 43, I think, was the last count that I saw. So at this time, I'm going to stop the screen share and set up those breakout rooms. Um, so at this point in time, you're going to be automatically assigned to breakouts, and we will call you all back when it's time in about 10 minutes. All right, enjoy your conversations.
and yes, we work a lot with Wesley. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm just going to join in for a little bit. Cool. Hey, Chris. Had to get in with my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, see that, that all the small groups. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, you know, honestly, of, of all the groups, there's no doubt that I probably work the most with the three of you when compared to any of the other groups. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, first that Bulldog Pantry. I've heard a lot of good things uh, coming out of there. How, how were you guys able to transition during that time? <laughs> it's been tough. Um, because we need the volunteers hands-on to hand out the food. We can't get around that part. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the other work, as far as we've done some online fundraising stuff um, and contacting with businesses to get support and food and that kind of stuff can be has been kind of switched and happened virtually. Um, there's a lot of marketing things um, that the students can work on virtually. Um, but we still definitely need the hands-on help to get the yeah. food out. Yeah. Are, are you all provided with any PPE or protective materials? Hey, folks. It, it looks like the Blood Center and an Allie are not assigned. Um, Allie, did you just join in? My computer died, I so I just got it back on, on um, in terms of the virtual volunteers. Do either of you have any volunteers working virtually yet? You know what? Hang, hang on one second. Um, Allie, I'm going to have you join a, a room because there's okay. still plenty of time. Um, so send you over. And then the blood center. Who's, who am I talking with? Allie, did you get moved over? I do not think so. Um, try that again. Wow, let's see. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, I'd love to get you in one of the small groups. Um, let's do this. Let me see if I can do it this way. Yep, okay. All right, I'm going to sign you over right now. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and who's okay. on for the I blood center? Hi, Chris. So sorry. I don't know what's going on with my um, laptop, so I'm now okay. using my phone. And I was on, I was in a group with um, Habitat and Mar Maricela and JD. Oh, great. Okay. I will, let's see. That was Habitat. Maricela. Oh, yeah. Okay. I will move you over right now. That's breakout room two. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. And then Amber, it looks like something happened and you got bumped out. From Boys and Girls Club. Um, I'm gonna assign you back over to a group. Do you remember Amber, which group you were with? Any of the names or anybody else? Okay. I'll just assign you to one right now. And then I've got another number over here, a uh, 559 number, last three digits, 328. I'm not sure who that is. All I have is a phone number. Okay, I'm not sure who that is. I'm gonna go ahead and assign you over to a breakout room. Um, well, you know what? If you would like for me to assign you to a breakout room, please either throw into chat or unmute yourself and let me know or let me know what you what you would like to do.
Was that Tim before? At the door? No. Yeah, that was Tim. I laid him in the sanctuary. He said he's going to be here a while. I'm How to go, Jackie? Great. Good. Good idea. Some things being done, some things um, under consideration, and certainly an interest in additional ideas. Great. When we have a reporter. Well, welcome back, everybody. I think everybody's joining us uh, again. Um, we'll give it a, a couple of minutes to repopulate, a, a, a little bit, little more time to repopulate. Um, and uh, I know a couple of you ran into a little bit of an issue here or there with with the, the breakouts, it does happen. Um, but uh, hopefully you had some great conversations. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go back to my screen share at this time. But if you would, um, before I do that, if you would go ahead and jot down any ideas that you had uh, about virtual practices into the chat and again if you just I, I don't want to assume that er, that everybody's been on zoom a lot um, if you'll hover down to the bottom of your zoom screen uh, you'll see a chat icon you can click on that and your chat box should appear somewhere on your screen for me it's to the right of the picture of the video picture so if you just take a moment and write into chat some ideas we'll we'll kind of go through those a little bit any ideas that came up for virtual volunteering this coming semester? So Maricela is talking about connecting our organization to spread the word on social media. A lot of students very savvy on social media and um, regardless of the, of the course they come from, whether it be marketing, PR, management, um, those kinds of th uh, things are certainly possible. Um, production of virtual events. Again, certainly some of our students come with backgrounds in uh, video, audio, um, and a lot of tech stuff. Um, so there may be possibilities for that. Um, we have, and one of the things that I will be sending out post today's webinar is a list of all of the service learning courses that are gonna be offered next semester. Keep in mind that while there's about 80 of those, I'm sorry, there'll, there'll be about 30 of those on that list, many of those have multiple sections. So Marketing 100S, for example. Marketing 100S, I believe, has about six sections of that course that are gonna be offered this next semester. And each section, has roughly 40 to 50 students. So a number of marketing students, PR students, that can help with uh, production, social media, those kinds of things. Um, Taylor mentioned building structure into virtual volunteering, regular check-ins, holding volunteers accountable. Again, that's a great thing for students to help out with. We've got students from humanics courses, students from our sociology courses, uh, students from communication courses, that would be able to do that. Um, interns for virtual happy hour, just to connect, to, to help um, develop those, promote those, guide those, great idea. Uh, reaching, out, uh, reaching out to organizations via social media. Again, we talked about that. Data entry, there may be some data entry research kinds of things that you would like students to do. That's great. Um, an idea that came up yesterday, and it may be down here a little bit, is educating you and your staff on different kinds of uh, technology tools that are out there. For example, one that was mentioned specifically yesterday is Marco Polo. If you're not familiar with Marco Polo, it's, a, it's another tool for communicating with um, small or large groups of people via video and chat. And it's a closed group, and it's a great way to stay connected and a great way to share information with your volunteers, but you may not be familiar with Marco Polo. You might not be familiar with Zoom or Google Classroom or all of those things. Students can come in and prepare, you know, small, very digestible, easy to follow trainings 
on any kind of software that you might think about. Um, so let's see, Sherry mentions our nonprofit has gone to virtual learning and we are still working out how that works for our students with disabilities. Hopeful that we can build programs for virtual world and engaging students in virtual volunteering uh, and, and that would be fantastic. Um, training students to host fitness programs from Artie, that would be great. They can, they can um, we, again, we've got some kinesiology courses where those students might be better trained, recreation students who might be better trained to do those kinds and lead those kinds of, of fitness programs. Um, leading educational lessons and courses on Zoom for uh, SBCA volunteers, that's fantastic. Um, and also research projects for Central La Familia and fundraising and marketing for NAMI. Uh, and those are all excellent, excellent ideas. So as a matter of fact, I spoke with a faculty member yesterday about the idea about fundraising um, projects. So, and they were interested in engaging their students in those kinds of things. Um, CASA uh, virtual art night for volunteers, great. Um, might be volunteers to help with that. Uh, donate, uh, calling donors and thanking them, maybe writing donors, that's another really good one. Reading aloud for young children at, with EMP, that's fantastic. So re students recording um, uh, little lessons, uh, reading, and we've got two or three courses that um, work specifically with students who want to be teachers. So um, keep that in mind if you are working in any kind of tutoring, mentoring type programs. Uh, home craft projects for animals, baking treats, making masks, making dog and cat toys, all of those things are certainly possible uh, virtually, whether it be for service learning or for general volunteers, um, uh, certainly a possibility. And there is an animal science course, Animal Science 67, Animals in Society. Um, not all sections utilize service learning, but many of them do. And so you'll, you'll receive that information when I send the list of classes. And just a couple more, uh, sending welcome kits to new virtual volunteers. So volunteers helping other volunteers feel welcome and, and, uh, and informed and, and uh, prepared to do their work. Um, video editing, um, again, social media, promoting virtual volunteer fair, uh, which we will have, and Trish will share more about that in just a moment. Um, many other good ideas. Again, we will share this chat and we will, you'll be able to look through all of those. So at this time, um, I am going to go back to screen share and have Trish talk about a very exciting opportunity that we have for all of you to share information with students from all across campus. Trish, go ahead and take it away. You're on mute, you're on mute. Chris, just kidding. <laughs> Chris go. muted me. I didn't even realize I was muted. Um, we um, look forward to the Community Service Opportunities Fair every year, and obviously this year we're not going to be able to do it um, the way we used to, so we are going to do it virtually. So um, tomorrow you will all get a link to register for the fair, um, and you'll be able to put in your uh, mission and then some volunteer opportunities that you may have for the upcoming semester, whether they be virtual, in person, or a combination of both. Um, and then we're going to put that on our website and we're going to have the fair the week of August 31st through September 4th. So we're, um, we'll be promoting it through social media and different outlets through faculty, um, getting the information out to students and kind of directing them to this website, our website, so they can look at the volunteer opportunities. Um, the nice thing about this is if they, before if they missed the fair, they kind of missed out on the information and the chance to talk to you. Um, the way we're doing it this way, they have not only a week, but these are gonna be opportunities that will be on our website throughout the semester. Um, and we're hoping that we can update those opportunities as things change. So whether you are virtual at the beginning of the semester and then there's some in-person um, opportunities that may come up, um, these are things that we'll be able to adjust on our website and that students can get um, the information um, for, oops, sorry. Oh, there we go, sorry. Um, sorry so students can have the information ready to them um, throughout the entire um, semester. So that's, that'll be coming up. The deadline is August 17th. It's a Qualtrics survey. It's very easy. It's kind of the way you register. You're just going to put in a little bit more information um, because this is kind of the way you're going to recruit volunteers as well. So 
Great. Thanks, Trish. Um, we're going to be sending a, a couple of emails post uh, webinar today. Uh, the email that, that Trish is talking about at the fair will be a separate email because it, we think it's such an important event and um, many of our students and faculty will be using this as an assignment um, for their students to go into the virtual community service opportunities fair to find out about volunteer opportunities and um, many of them will uh, will probably be contacting you based on that information this year so please be sure to stay tuned for um, that email that Trish sends out tomorrow and register as soon as you can and certainly before the August 17th deadline. If you're unsure at this point about volunteer opportunities, by all means, take, take, a, take a few days, um, consider them, talk with your staff, talk with others, and go ahead and spend some time developing those. You can always email Trish and you know, bounce around ideas. Um, you can email me. Uh, we're, we're here to help you all along the way. A um, couple of things before we get into uh, questions and, and just kind of an open time for everybody. Um, some next steps. So we, as I've said, we'll, I will send all participants uh, that are involved in today's workshop as well as uh, yesterday's workshop, a list of all the fall service learning courses. And if you've got questions about those, there's not a lot of information. So by all means, um, if you've got questions like, wait, hey, what, I see this, animal science class, what do they do? Who do I get in touch with? Contact Trish or myself and we can help you out with that. Um, we're gonna send a copy of today's Zoom meeting recording and the chat. So you'll be able to look back over that chat, especially with all of these great ideas around different ways to engage students in virtual service. Um, we will also send you a link where you can post short-term and one-day service opportunities. Um, and ongoing volunteer opportunities as well. So we have, as I've said, we've got these volunteer opportunities, we've got service learning opportunities, we have internship opportunities for students, and we distinguish a little bit between those where you may not you know, quite understand the, 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 the ways that we divvy that up, but keep in mind that you, know, you may need volunteers, you know, just somebody to, to help staff an event. Um, somebody to make some phone calls for you, somebody to send out some emails, but it might be something that we've talked about already, like social media, it might be a food distribution, it could be anything like that. We have a link that you can click into, post information there, submit it to us, and we will share that information via um, our three social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We will also be able to share that information given enough lead time, lead time with uh, about 2,000 students who receive our Epicenter e-newsletter every other week. Um, and we will share it with faculty members in particular courses when we think that it's appropriate. So um, you'll receive that link also in an email. And then from time to time throughout the semester, we'll be soliciting information from you regarding your service needs and opportunities. We know that's gonna change a lot. We know that in this virtual format, it might be more difficult to get the word out and to recruit students. So we want to be able to have the most up-to-date information from you as possible. So we'll be setting up a system where you can go ahead and submit that information to us, you know, on a semi-regular basis, maybe once a month or so. Um, but we, the first step will be that community service opportunities fair that Trish talked about. And then lastly, we'll continue to work with you to connect you with faculty members and students as appropriate. And so by all means, if you ever have questions, you ever have specific needs, um, contact Trish, contact myself. Trish's role as the Community Partnership Coordinator uh, for our office and for our campus is to be that matchmaker, to work with you, to connect you with the resources here at Fresno State as best as possible. Um, we're also going to ask you to please, you know, consider next steps. Oops, uh, to brainstorm those virtual service opportunities with your uh, agency colleagues, to be prepared to share those in surveys that we send out, to register for the fair by uh, no later than August 17th, and again to continue consult with us and ask us questions and work with us wh wherever you see possibilities of connections with Fresno State and Fresno State volunteers. So at this time, I'm going to open it up to questions. You can either add those into chat. I'm going to stop the share. 
You can add those questions into chat. You can um, unmute yourself and ask those questions and we'll go from there. Um, I know that's a bit of a free for all, but with as many people as we have on the call today, um, we'll just, we'll, we'll do our best to navigate that. So you can, you can throw your question in, into chat or go ahead and unmute and ask the question yourself. Please feel free to do that, folks. Just go ahead, unmute, and speak up. Any takers? I see a lot of familiar faces out there. Also would invite, if any of our panelists have anything additional they want to add, you, uh, we, you're invited to do that as well terms of what you've heard today or anything that stimulates you to, to give a little more feedback or input. Chris, you mentioned that uh, the in-person opportunities that might come with some new guidelines from the university. When will those documents be ready to review? Uh, Lowell, I hope in the next week to two weeks, certainly before the semester starts. Um, many of you who've worked with service learning students in the past have seen these learning plans that students will bring to you. Um, they usually just require a little bit of information from you about your site, um, about your contact information. Um, in, in this form is going to be very similar. You may receive it electronically, either from our office or from the, from the student or from the faculty member, and have the opportunity to fill it out electronically. That certainly is something that might be happening. Um, that's really the, that and another form that is a self-evaluation of your site and any risks that are out there. Those, that particular form, Trish is going to be sending out probably in about a week or so, um, somewhere in that neighborhood. And that form is going to be via Qualtrics, which is a, 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 an online survey tool. So if you've ever taken a survey monkey, um, survey uh, online, you'll be able to just go in and answer some questions about your site and about the needs, um, or I'm sorry, the way that volunteers will be engaged with people. Um, the, the big things there are, for example, if students are working unsupervised with at-risk populations, seniors, disabled children. Um, so Lowell, for you, all of those might apply. Uh, potentially other than the seniors. So in that case, Trish may reach back out to you or someone else may reach back out to you just to get a little more information from you. Um, but the forms, look, we know you don't want and don't need to be filling out, you know, 15 different forms for every student. And these are all, all these forms are pretty simple and straightforward and we'll do our best to keep them as streamlined as possible. Okay. Um, Artie asks, will, will organizations uh, do fingerprinting of volunteers, even if it's virtual volunteering? So that's a question for the group, correct, Artie? Right. Okay. So um, I'm wondering if any of you have done uh, fingerprinting requirements in the past. I think Boys and Girls Club is on the line, a couple of other organizations. Will you be doing, will you be requiring volunteers to be fingerprinted this year? if they're not serving in person, correct, Artie? Right. Yeah. I'm so curious. Throw that into chat. Put it into chat? Yeah, that'd be great. Or Kim, you're online. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so if, if the intern or the volunteer is actually, even though it's virtually going to be interacting with the families we serve, then yes, we would require them to have to go through that live scan. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, okay, other questions? She's muted. Prince? I think someone was speaking, um, but she's muted. Oh. I think Judy was saying something. Yeah. Oh, hey, Judy. I, I, I can go after Judy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Judy from Fresno Unified. Yes, it's uh, mandated that we have to fingerprint our volunteers unless um, we already have a conversation with Dr. Najin. We're going to allow the students from that particular class to uh, do 
phase one with no fingerprints, but they have to be along with a Fresno Unified School District staff via Zoom, and they will participate in different group settings, as well as a volunteer as guest speaker. So they don't need the fingerprinting. Right. Um, some of the phone calls that they can make also, they don't need the fingerprinted, only monitored by a facilitator, which is me. So that is another opportunity. But definitely in phase two, when they announce that they have to come back to face to face, everybody has to go through HR to get fingerprinted. Great. So that's Fred, that's all of Fresno Unified, correct? Correct. Yeah. Prince? No, she answered my question. I, I think um, we're going to fall possibly along those same guidelines. So I'll check in with HR and see where we are with that. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Other questions? Suggestions? I just had a comment to add yeah. to that. Um, I, I'm Lorraine with uh, Family Services of Tulare County. So we work with um, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. So even though um, we won't have advocates going out and meeting with clients in person, they'll still have contact with them. So that would be either through a phone call, through one of the hotlines, um, something like that. So we would still need to have them fingerprinted um, because they will have contact with those, um, those victims or survivors. Um, and I just called, um, the sheriff's department because they're the one that handles the live scans for us um, and they are doing um, appointments so if anybody is needing to do that you may have to do that and schedule those ahead of time um, rather than just have in the past we've just had them go whenever they're open so in this case um, they they it may take them a while to like get in and have that done so just kind of to think about that when planning Great, thanks, Lorraine. And, and and I think it, it's important to let you know that that Fresno State's policy on this is fingerprinting, whether it be fingerprinting, TB screening, um, whatever kinds of uh, risk management policies that you have within your agency, you dictate those. We don't require students to be fingerprinted if they're working with these groups. We don't require them to be TB tested you're going to decide that for your agency because it's your agency that needs to set the parameters on those kinds of things. And I would, I would encourage you to, you know, work as Lorene has just said already, you know, make contact if you're going to have fingerprinting or TB uh, screening through a certain organization to make sure that you, you communicate with those folks in advance so students know what the process is gonna be. Um, uh, Dom from Discovery Center, would you be willing to share procedures for in-person volunteering at your location? There, I'm, I'm muted. Yeah, in person, we have been um, called upon by the California Conservation Corps. Um, I thought the state of California, their state employees, I thought the state of California would uh, rescind there were uh, 48 volunteer hours and they did not. Um, so we're, um, we're bringing them on to the Discovery Center. We're an outdoor setting. Everything they do is outdoor. Uh, they have face masks. They have their own protocol because they work amongst themselves. They need to get back to the community 48 hours. And so in doing so and working with their, their manager, they went ahead and um, I cannot take more than 10. I got six at one time. Um, we had social distancing. We had one bathroom. They were allowed one person at a time in the bathroom. Um, we had our staff on. They came on Friday because they work for four days, 10 hours a day uh, for their 40 hours um, for whatever work they do for this, for their pro, whatever program they're on. And so um, I only take them up to four hours. Um, and so that four hours is uh, designated for them to work in the space that we have uh, to do uh, park beautification. Uh, it, it's um, basically gardening, weeding, and things like that. So that's on site, in the open. Um, and when they're finished, uh, I sign their, their paper and they're gone and they have their own transportation. So that was an actual face-to-face -face, uh, that we had uh, at the Discovery Center. Very recently in uh, uh, early 
June to early July. July the 4th was the last day that they were there. And now I think they're on spike and they're going fighting uh, wildfire fires right now. So they're gone. And Dom, so, will, will that opportunity be available to other volunteers? Will you set up opportunities for other volunteers to be able to do those well, kinds of the things? Only, the only other groups that we have are, are probably um, Boy Scouts, um, Eagles uh, candidates are actually have come and looked at the property and what they could do. And again, they cannot have more than 10. The cars, um, each family comes in a separate car. They're kept separate from each other. So they, and it has to be a really small uh, project uh, for them. So everything has to be small. I cannot even let them into a building to do anything as a group. That's just forbidden, completely forbidden. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm there by myself and I'm going to do a, some, a painting a wall or something like that, I can do it because I'm there by myself. There's nobody else on the property. Um, I, like I mentioned to some of the other folks, uh, Discovery Center may not even open to the public. Um, and we're making that discussion right now. Uh, just because of the liability and it just brings too many things into uh, um, to create the public coming back together. People want to get together and we just can't allow that. Um, and so the same thing with the students or any of the volunteers, they will be working uh, on property, you know, doing raking, trash, you know, whatever. The weeds are healthy out there. And so uh, we do trail cleanup, uh, cactus garden and so forth. So I can handle outdoor, but again, I cannot, I'm only gonna keep up to six people at a time and, and they cannot even get together um, for break or whatever. And so well, and that's it. And, and I, and I want to, I want to emphasize that Dom's example is a great one for everybody. You know, those are, those are particular kinds of opportunities that we may have a small group of students who say, that's perfect. We, we would love to come and help do that. It might be a student club. It might be a group from a class. It may just be a few friends that want to get together and, and, you know, are tired of <laughs> sitting at home watching, you know, watching Netflix all day long and they want to get out and do something different. So by all means, that's the kind of thing Dom and, and everybody else that we would encourage you to share with us via that link that I talked about before um, for posting short-term and, uh, and uh, uh, one-time type volunteer opportunities. Well, let, let me finish real quickly because I can go up to two hours with one car load if they're the same family group. They come and do two hours worth of service. They're gone. I can take a next group, do two hours they're gone a next group so i can fill the as we get into the fall the weather will get a lot better mm -hmm. and i i will have a lot of baby projects for them to do but i can never mix groups together it just right. it just isn't going to happen we're going to see this um um flourish or abate as far as the covid goes and, and i just don't want to chance any any groups getting together sure. uh, even families I, I can't do that so well thanks for sharing any other questions? Uh, you know, I want to be mindful of your time. Questions, comments. Um, we we're, we will stick around. But if there are any other big big questions um, or ideas for the group, please go ahead and unmute or throw those into chat before we officially end. Again, if you need what would like to speak make sure that you unmute hi i would like to invite everyone as we're trying to establish our um, facebook page and more social media contact i'd love to invite all the organizations to follow us and connect on facebook it's grid alternatives central valley on there you will see what we offer for our volunteers and right now we're currently offering free osha 10 classes to anyone in the tcc area which is the 93701, 93706, and 93721 zip codes. Um, a lot of the students might be in a related field where OSHA 10 is very um, handy to have. So um, I'm hoping that and reaching out to all of you to connect on Facebook and we're eventually trying to get on fa um, the other social media as well. And Marcella, I know that um, your organization works a lot with our construction management students, and so maybe engaging whole classes of construction management students to do just that, um, to, to like and to, and to share information about your organization via their social media sites. Yes, because it's really urgent that we connect more online and we need to bump up our social media, and I appreciate all your support. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anybody else?
Um, I'll, I'll turn it over. Trish, any, any final thoughts from you? You're, you're muted. Um, no, I was just continue to reach out to us as things um, ebb and flow with your agencies. If there's changes, if you have ideas, um, let us know. Um, look for the fair sign up because um, that's really going to help us as far as what you guys are planning on doing for the semester and help us get students um, interacting with you guys. And um, we're here. So just continue to reach out to us for sure. So, you know. Turn it back. Thank you, Trish. I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jackie in just a moment for any closing thoughts or words that she has. I just want to, again, thank you. Um, we could not do what we do if it were not for you. That million plus hours every year would not be possible if it weren't for you and your agencies and your staff um, making opportunities for those students and doing the work that it takes to utilize student volunteers. Um, we know that there are some fantastic students out there and they can do some incredible work for you and your organizations. We also know that sometimes there's a, there's a few problem children and, uh, and they take time, um, but they are learning from you. They're learning from their experience. You are co-educators, teaching them about the issues in the community that you deal with, teaching them about the social issues that, that cause those kinds of, of um, needs that your agency deals with. Um, and also just sort of professionally guiding them uh, in, in the different kinds of work that, that they do with you. So thank you um, for working with us. We look forward to, even in this very challenging time, and especially in this challenging time, we look forward to working with you throughout the semester and, um, and look forward to uh, better, more personal days ahead, everyone. Jackie, any last moment thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'll just add my thanks to, uh, first of all, to all of you, your agencies, for what you're doing out there, more critical than ever. We sure are needed what you're doing. And Chris, to you and your folks for making these resources available. All of you for coming and hearing about this and making your contributions and avail yourself of these resources. You know, in these, in the sudden changes, uh, Richter Center is not missed a beat. There are, there are still resources available. So, Thanks for being here. Thanks to all of you for what you're contributing to community. And thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for the opportunity to be involved here today. Absolutely. Good luck as you go forward. Thank you, everybody. I'll stick around if you've got particular questions and would rather ask them more directly to me in a smaller group. I'll stick around online. Other than that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Be kind. If you do have a question uh, and you're still on and would like to just unmute and ask, I'm happy to take those questions. Chris, I have one. <laughs> hey, Judy, how are you? Yeah, remember that I sent you a link for uh, the virtual mental portals that yes. I could be? Yes. We probably is going to be a big um, pilot program. We're going to partnership with this organization. So it is a big need for your students to participate. We are um, to recruit 100 volunteers to be matched with students, especially with uh, middle and um, high school. And they have everything under control is monitored. It is really awesome. And they, the experience for the volunteers will be also incredible. They're going to learn how to interact virtually as well as impacting a child with a curriculum that is already in place. So it's very a unique way. Uh, E-learning is the new way that we all have to walk. So they are welcome to, to get in touch with us because we need 100 volunteers to be part of this pilot program. You know what, Judy? Um, I am going to... Uh... I will send an email, an e-introduction for you to, um, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, different course class instructors. Actually, there's a couple of repeats in there. So there's only gonna be like four or five email addresses that I'm sending it to. Um, we have a um, three different courses in our liberal studies program that uh, that I think that they would be particularly interested in working with you. Um, but um, there, there may be some others as well. So 
I'll do a little e-introduction for you to those individuals, to those faculty members, okay? All right. Oh, you're muted, you're muted, sorry. Thank you, Chris and Trisha and Jackie, you look the same to me. You don't know me, but I know you. <laughs> thank, you. Oh, thank you, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> you have a wonderful day and a stay health and health, health and, 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 and of course, safe and healthy. Same, Thanks. same to you, Judy. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Linda, did you have a question? If you do, you're muted right now, Linda. I just wanted to. No. I guess not. Okay. Jackie, Trish, great job. Thank you. Great job. This is wonderful. What a great way to get a lot of people together and get a lot of information exchanged and lots of stuff in chat, huh? Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And I'll send, well, I'll, I'll pull all that stuff together and I'll send it all out and we'll go from there. It wasn't too bad with the bigger group too. I was surprised. I mean, it didn't yeah. seem like anybody got, I mean, I feel like everybody got to say something. It worked out really well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and we ended, we ended early, which is always good. Yeah. Yeah. The small group and the chat features really are great ways to, to, to collect input, to, ex yeah. to connect and then collect input. Yeah. yeah. Nice job, you all. Thank Jackie, you thank for you. doing this. No, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and for sure. We have an advisory committee meeting coming up, huh? Have you set a date for that yet? Uh, yeah, it's going to be virtual. And uh, I sent the save the date. I can't remember what that was. Uh, okay, October. You couple, so I probably you replied. It. You replied. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> I want to say it's like October... Uh, like October 6th or 7th, I think. Okay, Somewhere good. Around there. I mean, I knew I got something. Yeah. Let's see. Um, yep, October 6th. What a good mind. <laughs> well, I look forward to it. Same here. Thanks. Have you been in touch with Bud and Jan? Have you, have you talked to them on the uh, phone? Not for a few weeks. I think about th two or three weeks ago. Well, it was probably three weeks ago that I, that I actually called them. And talk to them a little bit, um, and then a uh, couple of emails here and there. But they're doing fine. They're plugging away. They did have they did have that little little bump in the road for both of them. But it it I think that it was just one of those things. To yeah. you know, something happened with Jan, and something happened with Bud. They neither one were particularly serious. But you know, so. glad to hear it. Great. Yeah. Well, right. love seeing you two. Thank you for this. I hope we do some more soon. Well, yeah. and actually, we'll probably be in touch and maybe brainstorm a few others for. We got to get through the beginning of the semester, so maybe something in late September or October, and maybe we'll have another topic or a check-in or whatever it might be. Yeah, Great. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. Good seeing you, guys. Talk have to a you great soon. Week. Thank you. Bye. Too. Bye. Bye.